I am Zuzana Fungacho. I'm a senior advisor at uh, BOFIT, and I will be chairing this panel. So in the morning, uh, the discussions concerning the debt were focused on uh, sovereign debt and how we will turn, and now we will turn to the corporate debt in emerging markets. And we are very happy to have uh, four distinguished speakers with us today. So um, we have uh, Professor uh, Emeritus Seppo Honkapo here from Alto University here. Then uh, we have Sanjay Banerjee, who is a professor of finance in Nottingham University. Then uh, Adam Gulan, um, who is senior advisor here at the Bank of Finland at the research unit. And uh, Eva Kerola, uh, senior economist at BOFIT here uh, in Bank of Finland. So uh, similar to the previous panel, each panelist will have time for his uh, talk. Uh, here we, we will have seven minutes for each panelist. And uh, let us start with Seppo. So I would like to ask you, how do you see the global economic situation in terms of risk uh, to the financial system now? So Seppo, please. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And let me, I have limited amount of time, so no further comments on, on general comments. <coughs> So, uh, in response to what Zana was asking, I'm, I'm going to talk about the financial situation from, from, a, from a general perspective first and then some, something about the corporate as side towards the end and emerging markets as well. So, so the, the, uh, as, you, as you all know, I'm sure, the situation uh, is in the world is, is significantly going, worsening. Uh, the, you know, this has happened now right as soon uh, as, as the COVID pandemic was was being being brought up under control, and so so we you know we we had the COVID crisis, which was a significant crisis, and now right after that we have we're getting a downturn in the economies, and and interestingly, what is in, uh, interesting is that these negative trends, current negative trends, they stem from supply side con concerns from the COVID, and so this is you know this is an, an example of a significant supply side shocks, which we don't see negative shocks in supply in, in the economy that much. And, and, and so, so that, that's the situation. And of course, as you well know, the two concern, main concerns are in inflation and, the, and related to that, the tighten, significant tightening of monetary policy. Let me start by with the, with the risks to financial stability. And let me just see that. Or maybe it's not on. Let's see. No. Yeah. No, it's not on. Yeah. There we are. Okay. So, so I'm going to use three figures, but they are they are figures, not three slides. They are figures, not text. <laughs> so, it, so I'm I'm allowed to go above the limit. So anyway, the first is re financial risks. You know, you can see here the financial conditions index. Uh, for, for you know for for the in, for main areas there and also also a shorter term figure about the what city what's the situation in the markets the volatility and liquidity which, which show these trends and indeed the risks to financial stability we we see in 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 in, in increased volatility in both equity and bond markets and 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 of course the 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 near term forecasts are showing for a slowdown in, in growth and, and still fairly high inflation rates, possibly uh, slowing down a little bit next year, but then that's, that's of course, a not very uncertain situation. So the risks to near-term economic development also like policy rates, as you know, are increasing uh, quite rapidly and are expected to increase further into, as we go into 2023. We're also having, starting to have in Europe these problems with the some of the some of the euro area countries some southern european countries we are seeing increases in bond yields which are now uh, at at the pre pandemic level or or even even slightly higher and of course if you look at the emerging markets there are differences but um, on the whole on the whole the stock markets in uh, in emerging economies have developed negatively of course that's a, it's not universally true because there are these uh, you know, commodity producers' economies and they, their stock markets, of course, have been improving. And you can see these phenomena uh, b b with those two slides, slides here. 
So if I now now turn into into the about what what about the emerging market economy? Some sort summary again. There's the financial conditions with the for the emerging markets, and as you can see, uh, there are on the whole negative developments for 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 the, for these EMEs. Uh, the commodity mar prices is, is, as I said, that's a that's a non-universal situation because there are commodity uh, there are commodity price producers, and but the prices those markets have been fairly volatile: oil, wheat, and uh, and, and natural gas, for example. Similarly, metals is is uh, is is showing similar development, an increase increases in early this year, and then volatility in the in the prices, and EMUs have have then. Faced, uh, faced this tight situation, and so central banks, in, in also in EMEs, not only in advanced, advanced economies, are on the whole in the process of tightening their interest rates. The stock and bond prices have fallen in the US and European markets and also emerging markets, except for these commodity producer, uh, commodity exporters. The U.S. dollar is increase of the, in the U.S. dollar exchange rate is of course one other major development here, and that has that has gone up against most 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 currencies in advanced advanced economies and 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 EMEs as well. Borrowing costs in low ra low rated markets are, have increased a lot, and 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 are 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 higher higher than those in in investment grade. Great, and then portfolio po pro fo flows have also been under pressure, with increased currency flow unflows that have stabilized. It should be said for some, but not all all emerging market countries. And you can see some of these figures, figures here in this, not not really the currencies, but the, but the but the financial conditions. And also we see that you know if you look at the what the banking system. So here we have. Here we have on the right hand side we have the advanced economies, the, the percent of assets below 4.5% 4, 4 common equity, tier one, and we can see that there is no 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 problem in the in the advanced economies, but there is begins to be a problem for emerging economies. Quite clearly, about nearly a third of of these bank assets are are, are below are below the, com, the common equity tier one ratio. So, so, the, so the interesting thing about these these problems is that you know one can argue, you know, what what sort of shocks did we have? Of course, the COVID shock was significant, uh, and cre and it created these bottlenecks, uh, lockdowns, etc. And they are significant shocks, but they are not. Are they global shocks? Why why are they not? Why are they? You know, the consequences we are seeing are largely global and not just regional. That that's that's a not, it's not an entirely clear picture. The, the, obviously, the second thing which we see, we see in Europe, but which has international repercussions, is the Ukraine war, which started in February. Again, it's not a global re event, but it has had a significant internal, international re repercussions because of the energy markets. Energy markets, uh, uh, you know, the, the supply of energies from, uh, from, uh, and also demand for energies was, has, has, has changed as part of the, the conflict in Ukraine. Of course, these are. We are also in an interesting situation in the sense that we don't quite know. We are in the process of of, of this happening, and it's it's very difficult to, difficult to say what what ha what's, what's going to happen. And second of, second, I should say, there are also time lags. Uh, the luckily the financial data and price data comes quickly. But what about the real real economic activity? We are seeing. We are seeing the first quarter of this year, the second quarter, second tentative numbers, but that's that was most, and so that's that's an that's an also says that we are in the middle of this process. Hard to say anything very different, definite where this this process is going on, and I'm al also almost out of time. But let me let me show you the third figure, which is about the the sovereign debt exposures of of banks. In, in emerging markets and comparison to advanced countries, so on the on the left you see the situation that the in especially in emerging markets we have banks which have a lot of for you know sovereign debt in their portfolio, and 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 then on the right we see you know a little bit of the structure of these these debts, and we see that yes you know there are 
you know, this is in, in about bond holdings in, in various places. And you can see that, that there is, a, again, the same picture, same result, that there's domestically held, back, held debt a lot, and in particular banks, banks are important as part of this. So what, what, what we are seeing here in, this, in these figures is that, that the, the, after the COVID pandemic, there has been a tighter situation that the situation uh, uh, with the sovereign bank bank nexus in the e emerging markets in particular. Sovereign debt holdings are now about 17% of, of assets. And you know that, that's the left-hand figure. And in advanced economies, they are something like 7 to 8%. So there's a very significant difference there. At the same time, of course, public debts are in many countries high levels and sovereign, sovereign debt or credit outlooks are, are deteriorating. So this is, this is, I'm not saying that this is uncertainty, but this is saying that it is possible that, that in emerging markets, we are, or in some of them, we are going to start to see this, this problem of a feedback loop between the banking and, 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 the, Soviet, uh, and the sovereign. So, and which is, we know that if that gets bad, then that's going to be a big, big problem in macro-financial stability. And that could that could f spill over to the funding of non-financial firms as well. If we have a if we have a serious financial crisis of that sort, then that's going to be financing difficulties for non-financial firms. And and the problem again is the same as what I said already before. This process is going on at the moment. We don't we don't have any certainty or any even it's even hard to give probability statements about what what might happen. But it's worth keeping in mind that that this problem exists and could get worse. Okay, thank you thank very you. much, Seppo. And uh, now let me pose a question to Adam. Uh, so uh, what do you think are the important features of the, uh, of the debt of non-financial companies in emerging markets? Can we see some similarities between these countries? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to mention two features that characterize uh, non-financial corporate debt in emerging countries. And uh, one is related to its structure and the second is related to uh, issuance of that debt. So if you look at the first slide, this is the decomposition of non-financial you know, corporate debt in, a, in selected uh, emerging countries uh, divided uh, into two main categories, bank loans on the right and the bonds on on the left. So the measure here is outstanding stock of that debt uh, relative to GDP expressed in percent. Uh, so if you look just briefly at the, uh, at the y-axis, you see that you know, loans are still the predominant mode of finance relative to market debt. It's, it's still much uh, bigger. But uh, the t trends are different, right? So if you look at uh, loans over the last two decades or a bit less, you see that uh, this b b bank loan uh, lending has been rel relatively flat in most countries. And you can see some trends in Russia, which is green and China, yellow. But apart from that, it's pretty flat. Uh, you see the global financial crisis. You see COVID here, but uh, these are stock variables, so, um, uh, you know, these are just optics uh, sli or s slight wiggles in the data rather than uh, trend breakdowns. So uh, th those trends seem to be stable. Now, if you look at bonds, however, those trends are very different. You see that m most of those countries uh, plotted here have seen a sharp rise in uh, issuance of market debt. Uh, and in some cases, like again, yellow China, Mexico is brown and uh, orange is Thailand, uh, have seen a, a, essentially an explosion of, of uh, market debt. Uh, I have reported here most of major emerging countries, uh, notably skipping uh, India, Thai, um, Turkey, excuse me, and, and uh, any of the Central European countries such as Poland, be, they also see the trends, but the bond markets are uh, relatively minor, so they wouldn't even fit the scale, but Sanjay will have more to say about this. Uh, 
Uh, now, what drives those trends? Uh, well, you can think of push and pull factors uh, in international finance, right? And the pull factors will have to do with the fact that we didn't have seen uh, many uh, emerging market crises uh, like the ones we have seen in the 80s and in the 90s. So those countries have grown bigger, richer, uh, more stable economically. They became a larger share of uh, global economy, so became more attractive investment places. Um, uh, those, uh, so firms in those countries have accumulated more, uh, more uh, equity and uh, clearly they become, became more attractive. Now for the push factors, well, the, the main uh, elephant in the room is perhaps the uh, very expansionary monetary policy that, uh, that uh, the developed world has witnessed over the last decade. Now, the, the trends, as you see, they have, they have been before 2008, but they have really picked up after the global financial crisis. And, uh, you know, with international investors having hard time to find high return assets uh, in the US or in Europe, they would essentially search for yield uh, and turn uh, more to emerging economies. For banks, it's more difficult because banks after the GFC have witnessed uh, tightening of regulations and you can say that they became more uh, risk averse in, in terms of uh, uh, purchasing assets from, uh, from abroad. So hence this rebalancing uh, to bonds. And uh, overall, the, the supply of, uh, for, for uh, investment funds or pension funds in, in developed world due to uh, aging population has been uh, growing, so the, the, the necessity to invest those funds goes up. Now, the second thing I want to mention more briefly is, the, uh, is more about uh, data reporting. So most of the data that you will uh, ever see, including the graph that I sh have shown before, is residence-based debt. Uh, if the firm is uh, registered in the country, within the country border, then its debt will be on the debt, uh, of that country's debt statistics. But uh, it frequently happens so that firms um, have their daughter companies offshore, and uh, it is those daughter or even granddaughter companies that issue that uh, debt, and uh, in which case uh, the debt will actually be reported in the offshore uh, country. So take a, a, a clear example of China, which would have, uh, due to capital controls, a daughter company in Hong Kong, and that daughter company in Hong Kong will issue the, uh, um, this debt. So it, in the drastic case, if you look at the right panel, which is emerging countries, and you look at the black dots, and the very right y-axis, this is percent. This is percent of all international debt of NFC firms for a given country. And the 90% for China, which is the left column, tells you that 90% of uh, Chinese international debt is not issued in China itself, but offshore. And it can be uh, Caribbean offshore centers, it can be uh, East Asian uh, centers. Uh, so, uh, in other words, the international uh, NFC debt is 10 times bigger uh, than, uh, than what the residence-based statistics tell you. And uh, so this is an issue because it, it matters for interpreting the numbers. It, it matters for you know, knowing how much debt do we really have. Uh, that debt which is issued offshore is essentially 100% dollarized or euroized in some cases. Uh, and there is also a lot of off balance sheet items like foreign exchange rate swaps, etc. That um, So this is, this is a challenge for monitoring. And this means that we don't have a very good picture uh, what, uh, how big that debt actually is and how it will behave in, in times of stress. Thanks. Thank you very much, Adam. This is, you are perfectly on time, very, very nice. And now we will move to, uh, to two big uh, emerging markets and we will look at the situation there. So Adam has already mentioned India and uh, that it was somewhere else, uh, not on that graph. So 
uh, let's ask uh, Sanjay, how has the corporate bond market developed in India? And uh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Zizana. Okay, and uh, thanks. Uh, first, I really kind of thank the organizers to uh, uh, for such a brilliant uh, workshop com conference because I also f since morning have learned uh, a lot of new things. Okay. Now, I will be mostly talking about the Indian experiences, but I have decided to go a little bit a different route because uh, I have seen most of the speakers were concentrating on the debt market, right? So, I will be talking about the debt market experience in India first, and then I will talk about, since innovative finance is kind of one of the topics, I will be kind of coming to uh, to the later part of this talk on the some experience in India, the innovative finance part. So, corporate bond bond market Indian experiences actually had been quite piecemeal. Okay, there have been um, some periods the government and the investors have tried, had succeeded, again failed, succeeded, failed. Okay, so. Compared to you know what Adam kind of showed uh, you know the corporate debt markets in the other countries, so the Indian scenario okay was kind of a pretty dismal I would say, that is though it has increased by fourfold okay from last ten years, say from ten point six two billion outstanding debt to um, forty eight point twenty four. But compared to say the trillion levels like in the US 17.6, even Korea is 2.2 2 trillion, China is 26.7, okay, the market is kind of a pretty much uh, not, not in very good in shape. And also the corporate debt to GDP ratio, I mean what's actually what the matter is that compared to the GDP of the country, how big your market is, right? So we have to kind of absolute number doesn't matter much. So the tail of woes could be traced to, say like India could see just like 22% compared to 85% US and you know 101% on average recently. So there are multiple hurdles, okay. Um, we had kind of a, some time back uh, mentioned those, okay, and I'll be just, uh, just referring to this uh, on the passing. For example, in order to have a bond market, you have to have proper infrastructure, right? The infrastructure means like, you know, this is the intermediation. So like the bond dealers must be holding the inventory of bonds in order to make the market for, you know, buying and selling and etc. So there's a lack of intermediaries, lack of secondary markets, right? One buys bond in case of a liquidity shock, they want to get, a, get, get out, but then you don't find a counterparty to sell or buy, right? So. So all these things now, yet the government has made for the last uh, couple of years one very big changes, okay? Because in the bond, we kind of get like the fixed coupon unless there is a bankruptcy. So what the investors tend to worry about, how much I get if the companies go wrong, right? So in the bankruptcy, kind of India was say, almost like, you know, for it, Typical time for resolution of bankruptcy was almost say eight to twelve years, but very recently there had been a kind of a uh, banking sorry um, uh, insolvency in bankruptcy code, and that exactly tried to resolve that issue. And of course, the recovery rate has improved from four point one percent to forty five percent. Okay, the time for the resolution that has kind of a gone down under bankruptcy okay, to nearly two to three years, even sometimes less. But the haircuts have been massive, okay? which means that although the number of recoveries have increased, okay, but each case, the slashing of the price in bankruptcy, that has been extremely dismal, sometimes 90% of the cases. So I'll be kind of stopping for the for the Indian experience on the corporate bond market over here, okay? Because lots of efforts have been made, but we didn't make much of a move, okay? But on the other hand, see financial architecture. Even today's mornings talk about the green finance and etc. We're talking most of the times only the bond market, 
but the financial market actually kind of has a huge architecture like bond is kind of one part of it i mean there are equity markets there are different equity related product bond equity related products and etc so um i would kind of uh, just mention like uh the some success in the equity market especially for the small and medium um sectors okay so in india basically there are uh, i mean there are many other countries as well but the way the success of india kind of came in is that so there are sme platform there's two big sme platforms so there are the, restri- the less restrictions of kind of a, you know b- making an ipo over there and so that many small and medium companies could uh, kind of uh, pursue it. and one of the interesting features is that there you can get upgraded to the main sector from the SMEs, which means that is the firms first initially starting with the SME sector platform, but if they grow in size, okay, make inroads into the sales and growth, okay, they can migrate into the upper, like, you know, the topmost uh, tier, right? So there actually what we have seen, okay, is that the quite a bit of success, okay, like, um, so we kind of uh, just uh, had a study whereby we kind of compared the companies which are joining the main board from outside versus the companies which first initiated in the SME and then kind of uh, got upgraded to, you can think about the football league, you know, you can join the first division or somebody in the second division, become champion and go to the first division. So that kind of a thing. So there you could see that is there, like, you know, again, for the shortage of time, I'll just say that is the firms which has kind of migrated from the, to the main board, from the SME board, okay, they have done better performance in their equity in the sense of higher expected returns as well as their lower volatility. So what I'm just trying to say here, okay, especially I'll kind of just tie it up with this, uh, in fact, this morning's context as well, okay, that think about a very broad kind of a financing where, say, think of a green finance, where ultimately the problem is that adaption to the new technology, right? So it's a kind of a technological progress. Now the technological progress actually, if you look at the technological firm, okay, none of them had the bank finances to begin with. In fact, actually, the earlier speaker was talking about the difficulties of the bank finances. Bank will always kind of look at the resellability, redeployability of the assets, okay. Now, somebody is uh, doing changes in the technology, will have no assets if they fail, right. So, for them, the bond market actually would be also called luke, luke, lukewarm as well. But at the same time, in order to supplement the bond market, what my main point here is that one should have different kinds of equity market, not for the top tier firms, but for a range of firms, very different kinds of uh, products. For example, date sustainability issue that, um, that in the morning I was talking about the firms could, for example, change, swap, from old date to kind of a new date, but they could swap from, you know, old date to kind of an equity as well, right? So, which means that it would be giving investors kind of a more choice, okay? It would be kind of giving the firms more choice. So, the most innovative finance would be kind of integrating both equity and the debt market together rather than thinking in the silos. Am I right on time or? Yeah, you are already over time. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy. I hope that I didn't take too much of time. All right. No, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but I started to look at you. That's why. <laughs> okay. No, okay. okay. But now, now we we still have time to move to China. And Eva, uh, we have already heard about the high levels of uh, the debt in China. So Eva will tell us may, how have we come to this, and if there is a way out, possibly. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the organizers for inviting me to this panel. It's been a really interesting morning listening to, to the previous talks. So um, let's start with a figure of, we have seen uh, like some, some, some of these, these figures already, um, especially with, with Adam, but, but here's a 
figure of non-financial corporate debt per GDP in China and then in, in four uh, other countries, uh, Japan, Spain and Thailand, to give some comparison of countries that have also experienced high levels of corporate debt in the past. So China has accumulated a massive amount of corporate debt uh, during the past 15 years and today it's equivalent as Sanjay was showing the number, 27 trillion US dollars, so it's equivalent to around 30% of the total global uh, non-financial corporate debt. And, and the accumulation actually started um, in earnest after the great financial crisis um, in 2008 and 9, when, when China stimulated the economy by, by massively encouraging um, different agents to take on more debt and then invest that money into infrastructure and other construction proje uh, projects. And according to the initial plan, uh, the funds needed for the stimulus would come from three different sources, so central government, local governments and then banks. But local governments were already back then quite fiscally constrained and, and because they were prohibited to, to directly borrowing either from banks or or back then they couldn't issue their own bonds. So what they then did was they uh, established these own financing uh, corporations or the abbreviation is LGFVs or local uh, government financing vehicles. So then then uh, took care of the borrowing and, and, and the investing. And the stimulus worked well, uh, as we know, and because of that, I guess, this has been the, the way that China has boosted its economic growth ever since. Um, today, the LGFVs make up around 30% of the, of the corporate debt uh, in China. So one peculiarity in the Chinese context uh, with regards to the uh, non-financial corporation debt is in fact that large chunk of it is at least implicitly guaranteed by the local governments. Now, uh, today uh, it's estimated that almost 60% of Chinese corporates are today highly uh, leveraged or highly indebted. Um, the highly indebted here uh, by definition is that their cash flows are less than 12% of their total debt. And half of those corporates that are highly indebted are in property uh, and construction sector. And so as we can see from the figure, uh, debt levels this high as we see in China today are uh, at least in the past and in different uh, um, countries have resulted in some kind of economic slowdown and deleveraging process. Um, now, officials in China are of course aware of this, of this fact uh, and they, they know that high, high levels of debt is a challenge. And from time to time, they actually uh, try to do things about it and, and try to bring it down. But for a country that has accustomed to, to boost its growth by taking on more and more debt uh, and investing it in less and less productive investments, it, escaping this corporate debt trap is really difficult. And especially problematic it is in China that has been stuck to these very high and very tight GDP growth targets for like over 10 years now. Um, and one crucial reason also for the ever-growing uh, debt in the corporate sector with these LGFVs is that the local government officials, uh, their careers are, are really dependent on, on these uh, high, unrealistically high uh, GDP growth targets. So they have actually, if, if, if GDP growth uh, is stagnating, they have no other choice but to take on more debt and invest in, in infrastructure or or, or um, construction. So um, what China should do is, is to move away from these uh, numerical targets uh, and allow growth also to slow down from time to time. Uh, so for China to lower indebtedness would mean that they should tolerate also declining growth rates. And this is actually now what we are seeing is happening in the real estate sector. So, so the real estate sector has been highly indebted for years already. House prices have increased uh, massively and, and they have gone somewhat already out of reach of, of like normal workers. So it has also posed a social issue in the country. And people were no longer buying houses to live in. They actually bought them just to 
keep them uh, empty for, for investment sake. Uh, because they thought that, or they think that house prices will will grow up um, uh, forever. So now, about two years ago, China really decided that it was high time to do something about it, and 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 they started to pose restrictions on the debt. So that, uh, in the figure here, I have some indicators of the real estate sector in China. So you can see um, floor space starts, then there are sales of property and, and real estate investments. And the two gray bars, um, vertical bars, are then the uh, most important policy decisions that were taken to curb this excessive debt. So the first one was in August 2020. Um, officials imposed these three red lines for the de developers uh, to, to tell them what was the maximum amount of debt they could take. And then the second one came uh, some months later, that was restrictions for banks. So there were some maximum limits how much uh, banks' balance sheets could tolerate real estate um, dependent credit. And then as a result, when the highly, um, highly indebted developers could not get any more money from banks, they were left with their sales income. And at the same time, of course, 2020 was the COVID year, so there were some COVID restrictions, and, and actually the demand for houses was declining, so the developers were left with next to nothing. So they couldn't pay their subcontractors, they couldn't uh, pay their loans, they missed their bond payments, uh, they had to halt uh, some of their construction projects. And as developers started to, to really be in trouble and it started to be visible, then, then uh, people grew more and more uncertain about, about the thing and the demand fell even further. So as you see in the figure now, we are, the, the slump has, has lasted for around 18 months already and there have been some estimates that demand could fall for yet another six months or so. And so it has already uh, had a quite big impact on, on growth rates, but presently officials have held on to the initial goal of, of lowering the excess indebtedness, so they haven't stepped in uh, massively to, to stop this uh, decrease. So overall, as a concluding note, uh, if China really wants uh, to reduce its corporate debt levels, it would need to fundamentally change the uh, economic growth model. So move away from the heavy, heavy investment and credit-driven growth and towards more um, consumption-driven economic growth, where perhaps the growth rates would not be as high, but, but growth would be more sustainable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. So we are a little bit over time, I have to say. So <laughs> let's see if there are questions from the floor. Uh, anybody? Yes, let's start with Uko. Uh, microphone. You. I have a question for, um, for Eva. Uh, so I've done some work on, chi on Chinese debt, and um, one on especially the L the lock, I, I, Yes, <laughs> I always have problem writing yeah. that. But but I don't want to talk about this. So I, another paper that we look at was on the with uh, Richard Portes and E Wang was on the um, sort of uh, possible negative consequences of regulations. And what we found that when, when um, the, the Chinese central bank um, tried to limit borrowing from what they defined risky sectors, uh, then we had other firms acting like banks. So we had very large firms which were not linked by this that would bo issue bonds in dollars in Hong Kong and then relent to the firms which could not access the credit market. So, I, I just I don't know if that's something that that uh, that you have been thinking about because that's sort of it seems that this this regulation actually backfired and made the the, the system even more uh, fragile in a sense. Yeah, thank you. That that that's uh, definitely true. And and in China they are really innovative in in how to get money if something is regulated. So there has been this really huge increase of the shadow banking market during uh, the twenty tens like from 2012 onwards, but then they curbed the, the shadow banking market and then it moved forward to something else like you just described. So yes, that, that, that is a problem. And, and one part of the problem is that we don't know 
where it is and where it comes from and, and it can't be tracked. So yeah, fully agree. We have two more questions at least here in the front. Microphone, microphone, please. Thank you. My comment is really about linking what we discussed now with the morning sessions. Because in the morning we talked about green transition from a capital allocation point of view and also from a policy point of view. This session is really about deteriorating financial conditions. So I wanted to hear from the panel if they see channels directing from financial conditions to green transition challenges. For example, if a bond becomes more expensive, a local business group in a developing country might cancel cleaner technology applications. If working capital becomes more expensive, the same for cleaning applications. So I wanted to hear more about this and also related to the policy issue, if they can see any segment of industrial policy that can tackle this, these problems and these market failures as they evolve. Thank you. Shall we take the second question as well? In the back? Yes. Thank you so much. It's great, uh, great presentation. A specific point for Ava, I think it's important to, when you talk about the, the Chinese uh, targets for growth, the origin actually was related to figures on un unemployment. I, I believe that the, the figure of like some 5 to 8% or whatever was, was calculated because it was, was believed to be needed to, to address the unemployment that was growing from, for the restructuring of the S SOE. So it actually... That doesn't change at all your analysis, but it's, it's like, you know, it was actually a great target to have because they were worried about social unrest and it wasn't a particular financial, but you're probably still right. It probably still needs to be addressed. The, the question I have is also to you because, but, but for the panel in general, maybe it re relates to the previous question. If, if I look at your first slide, uh, the, um, I hope this was your first slide, I can't quite read it. The, the uh, credit to non-financial uh, corporates percent of GDP, that increase of China, I'd be interested to hear a little bit what those, uh, thank you, what, what those comparisons mean. They, they uh, I was saying to my neighbor, when you're telling this story about China, that, that sounded a little bit like the history of Donald Trump's business. It's like, the question is how long people do get away with the debt they accumulate. The trust in governments, I, I think, is really important. The, the, what people explain to me is that why China has been, has, has been able to have such a active private sector was that they have a trust in the government fulfilling their commitments and i'm just wondering what the implications of that are and and they're on that graph specifically is like there anything in there why it 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 is become higher in china and is it actually a, you know is it actually a problem if those government commitments are still to uh, you know pe people still believe they are upheld thank you thank you so let's start whoever wants to answer well, Maybe uh, let, I, I can, I, let me take the green one. I must say I'm not an expert on this, and I should really look at the sector more, more closely. But, but uh, surely, surely, you know, if the, if the financial situation is overall get deteriorating, that's going to have an impact on, on, on that segment as well. That green financing and this, this project financing is going to be, going to be more difficult. How, how much more and so forth, I have no idea. But, but I think that ten, this risk is, is, and this tendency is, is likely to be, be there now, in the, uh, right, right now. I should also add, which may be a little bit to what I said, is that the, you know, I've, I've looked at various, various other, other information concerning how, how people, how, how is the situation viewed. And, 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 and you know, the, the slowdown is, is, is fairly clear. But as I said, you know, there certainly central banks and other forecasters are suggesting that this inflation is slowing down now, has started to slow down, and they expect a significant, significantly better situation next year. And, and that, of course, if that happens, that's going to mean that the central bank's tightening of monetary policy will also, will also be less, less than what, what, what was perhaps perceived a little, little while ago. So that's, that's certainly one, one important thing thing here as well. There's also the question of the real growth of the economy, which I didn't have time to talk, talk but, but there again, you know, there's slowdown, but still the basic, for, the main forecasts in, of various institutes are on the positive side. But I have seen also some risk scenarios, which even suggest negative growth slightly. 
So, so that's the that's the situation concerning the other forecasting institutes. So, so I think it's, it's telling us that yeah, they, they, you know, we have difficult times ahead. But how difficult? It is, it is indeed very difficult to say say right now. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I would kind of add uh, something related to what he's talking about. That is, the world has probably kind of gone too much with the debt financing. But we already kind of know that there's a debt overhang problem, the risk shifting problem in the sense people take lots of riskier projects with debt financing and etc. Now, two issues. One is a post pandemic situation. Obviously, like in the similar circumstances, equity would be better than debt because the production instruments are already there. It is because of the problems of the contactability and disease. That's why you cannot pay the banks or the investors right on time. Right? So that the government has to kind of come up with a massive level of subsidies, printing of money. And I'm sure that is some of the problems that we are facing about this inflation partly due to all those kind of a liquid monetary policy carried out from those days. But with the equity financing, of course, there are many negative, some negative aspects are there. I'm not denying. But given the situation that if a shock is struck okay, by the forces for which no individual is responsible, right, then one should not, like, you know, I mean, Basic information theory says that is then you should not kind of uh, ask the person to pay for it, okay? Which is the interest is the kind of a commitment, but the dividend is not, right? And secondly, also like you know today's uh, in the morning talk about the sustainability and etc. So which means that like if you want to do this debt restructuring, now obviously corporate debt restructuring. Not just for the date, for the date's sake. For example, date restructuring means what? You extend the maturity of date. That's only one instrument. But you could, for, for example, convert date with equity as well. So for that, you need some sort of a development of the equity market as well. Especially for the Indian context, I'm kind of suggesting is that for the small and the medium units, right? So because much of the technological things would be coming these days from the small and medium sectors because we are not kind of going to see this huge GM or you know these guys are coming there are many many app based technology many kind of a new technology are coming from the relatively SME means that is a small levels of employment right so one should be kind of a, you know I mean it should be a kind of a, until a complementary you know, the platform to date is kind of a developed, then it means all the shocks are absorbed by one particular sector. That's not good for the economy. Let's let's continue with China. Go, no. go ahead. Take the Chinese question yeah, then. Go ahead. The Chinese okay. questions, yeah. So, so, yeah, definitely there is a high trust in government that it will step in if, if needed. And these implicit guarantees have been one problem in, the fina uh, in, in China because the risk is not visible. You, or, or you, don't, like, you think that there is no risk in, in buying bonds of, of uh, corporates that are somewhat uh, related to, to government. And actually they are now trying to do also something about the implicit guarantees, especially with the LGFVs. So, so Beijing has started to... Uh, say that that if an LGFV goes insolvent, it should go in, in bankrupt and, and local government shouldn't step in. So they try to actually break this implicit guarantee now for the L LGFVs. Let's see what happens. I don't know if, if one big LGFV goes bust and I don't know what would be the implications for the whole market. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's one reason why China has been able to sustain these debt levels it has, and also one like institutional, um, I don't know if you could say it's a flaw, but, but uh, the a need to save excessively. So, so the savings rate in China is like 48% or 45% or something like that, because they don't have safety nets and they have to save for their old days. And that's one reason why, why the debt levels are so high in China, because there is so much excess saving. 
So that's, on the other hand, it's a good thing that it's domestic backed uh, debt, but, but on the other hand, it's like uh, the money would be more efficiently spent elsewhere, I would say. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here, Tony, in the... Um, thank you. <clears throat> uh, my, my question relates to the, um, the growth of the ESG mandate in the investment industry, so the environment, social impact, and corporate governance mandates, um, which have now you know, risen up quite considerably in the marketing of funds. And there are you know, very mixed opinions about whether ESG is actually a, a valuable contribution or not. But, but I wondered what um, implications this has for uh, getting more capital, either equity or debt, investment in the developing world because of course you know there are now emerging market funds with ESG criteria um, which are relatively sort of small scale on the global financial landscape but you would think there are potential opportunities particularly picking up on the themes this morning about companies that have a, a very good uh, innovation technology in, in uh, environment, climate, uh, you know, a small SME that's doing excellent work in that area. Is it investable in terms of uh, debt or equity? Could it attract the ESG emerging market funds or is this, you know, something that's for the far future? Thank you. So that's, that's a question for anybody on the panel. <laughs> yes, yeah. and let's take Cornell as well. It's a very different question. I mean, this so far we've been talking about the debt crisis since the morning, but I was listening to presentations on the data. It seems there's also a financial crisis looming, um, you know, not too far in the future. The kind of data they suggest that you presented the examples of massive haircuts in India, the China property boom. So, is there a possibility of the debt crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, but uh, financial crises are where banks and non financial corporations go under? Is that possible in the emerging market context as we've seen in 2008? In the mid 90s in East Asia, the Latin American debt crisis, uh, financial crisis. Yeah. What's the possibility of a financial crisis going along with the debt crisis, which would be the worst of all possible worlds? Thank you. Uh, so, who wants to start? Maybe well, I. Oh, no. why don't you do it? <laughs> okay, so maybe I can say something about the financial crisis. Well, um, there is known unknowns and unknown unknowns. We, we, we already know from the experience of, uh, uh, of old times uh, sort of how the um, emerging markets, some types of emerging markets crisis work, uh, like the sovereign debt crisis in the 80s or then the, the East Asian uh, crisis. Now, we have already learned from that, so presumably some of those mistakes are uh, partly avoidable to the extent that we know the data. Um, so we, for example, know the problem of dollarization, right? Uh, now, uh, this has, for example, the problem of dollarization has changed. So back in the uh, 80s and even in the 90s, a lot of emerging markets sovereign debt was fully dollarized. So those countries faced clear currency mismatches in the sense that a lot of that was uh, in dollars, but revenue is taxes, and taxes are local currency. So clearly an exchange rate movement uh, creates a problem. Uh, today, with this huge pile of um, corporate debt, the picture is more mixed. A lot of uh, firms that issue debt, foreign debt uh, or international debt, it is dollarized, but uh, only some of those firms would have the currency mismatch. So uh, commodity exporters, a typical thing in, in emerging and developing countries, they don't have this issue because it's oil and it's uh, food uh, and this is all traded in dollars. Uh, but Eva will have more to say about this. Uh, if you have uh, uh, that, say, in the housing sector in China, which has all the revenue in yuan. I mean, as long as yuan stays uh, on, on fixed exchange rate, it's okay. But uh, there is a clear potential currency mismatch there. Now, another risk is uh, a bit perhaps uh, um, related to this offshore problem uh, is the lack of data uh, uh, and the overall development of finance. The fact that 
uh, a lot of uh, financial contracts are not even on balance sheets because they're foreign exchange rate swaps or, or different types of derivatives. So they are only conditional. A lot of uh, derivatives are used for hedging, but not necessarily. And then uh, we will presumably only know ex post because we don't have that data how, how those risks will resolve. Thank you. Seppo? Well, uh, Adam already said quite a, quite a lot of things, this, especially this currency match, match, match issue, which, is, which can be important for developing countries. I think uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise, I think, uh, you know, again, my, my feeling is that, you know, the, the, this time, the, first of all, the situation doesn't look that bad at the moment. The trends are, are, are worrying, but they, so far, you know, it's, it, it's serious, but it's, it's not, not really a crisis yet. And, and then the question is, are we, you know, which Adam already posted, have we learned from the past, past mistakes? And certainly, yeah, we have, we have one thing we know, as he said, we have the corporate, corporate debt is one part of the story, which, which is bigger than, 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 than before in the, in the earlier, earlier crisis. But, but, there, but there are a lot of uncertainties, so I, 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 will, I will not put any bets on any, <laughs> any directions. And the second thing is, is, is the Chinese, Chinese debt, which... I must say, I, you know, this, is, this is a, a, continues to be a puzzling. I remember some, I think it was eight years ago, I gave a talk, talk, uh, talk about the, the international debt situation. And I, I, I showed a graph where the Chinese debt ratio was much higher than the historically other ones have been, and said that you know, that, that is suggesting trouble. Well, that's eight <laughs> years ago. There's still, there's be, maybe some trouble, but not, not really a crisis yet in China. So. So maybe maybe the answer is that people trust the Chinese government still, or they they have deep enough pockets to handle this this situation and the will to handle this situation. Want to comment, Sanjay? Okay, uh, I'll kind of uh, address this ESG and the governance issues. Okay, see that like the ESG is an objective, not necessarily it would be a farm objective, right? It's a social objective, and in a typically kind of a you know, uh, in a company with uh, agency issues, with some small founding shareholders and lots of dispersed uh, stakeholders. So one needs two things, not only a large shareholder that we already kind of know for the proper governance, but a large shareholder with an ESG uh, objective. For example, pension funds, for example, okay. So until and unless, you know, in equilibrium, in endogenously it would happen, only in the market there would be a sort of large investors who would have a high stake enough to exert their pressures in the governance, but then their objectives must be aligned with the social objectives than the firm's objectives. Until that sort of things happen, or even I really don't know how those things happen in equilibrium even, because, you know, different objectives, uh, institutions' objectives are different. So the answer is that like we probably should not expect much to see the financial markets to make some progress towards ESG unless there is a matching of the objectives. Okay, Eva, do you have anything to add mm. on China? <laughs> or no, so? except echoing uh, Seppo in that probably it is the deep pockets that that's ultimately <laughs> uh, the the thing that is uh, refraining uh, China from from experiencing a financial crisis because there is like these ownership ownership and financial linkages are really opaque and 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 complex and one would think that there is like a high risk that something bad would would come out of that but it hasn't yet so <laughs> let's see <laughs> we ha do we have any more questions we have time for one short question, if there is any. I can ask about the, uh, about the future, maybe. So what do you think are the costs and benefits of the rise of the, in, in non-bank non financing? What do you see like going forward? Very short answers <laughs> and clear. Any? Ideas? Uh, I guess Adam I can take can some take of it. Yeah. Uh, well, so there is short run and long run. In the short run, uh, 
in the short run, it is more likely that uh, I think that the uh, growth in bond issuance may stop and this may or may slow down. And the simple reason is that uh, bonds are instruments that are more attractive uh, in good times and they also require the investors to have uh, a fair amount of skin in the game. Now, as the economy is uh, uh, subsiding now uh, globally, uh, clearly, uh, you know, th th this, is, this becomes an issue. Now, bank financing is more attractive in bad times because, you know, it's renegotiable debt. Uh, so, uh, from that point of view, um, uh, I would say that short run is, is more in favor of uh, bank loans. Now, in the long run, no. Uh, bonds tend to be cheaper. Uh, they have been also, it's a more long-term type of instrument that is used by larger firms. As, as firms grow larger in emerging countries, uh, more of them will be seen to issue bonds. Uh, let me stop okay, here. thank you. Any other Predictions Sepo. for the future? Yeah. Uh, no, no, Sanjay go can go. go ahead. You're a finance professor. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you see, that is innovative finance. Let me kind of just, uh, only I think I'll just say this look at say, today's technology, this everything that we are in this room, right? It has kind of completely non existent 15, 20 years back, right? So it has been kind of made possible through the venture capital organization of those intermediary within the financial sectors in a very big way with making complex contracts with the investors okay i mean there are you know several studies okay documenting how the venture capital kind of works now nobody actually asked them to produce internet right so that's how the market kind of responded like you know, with the new technology number one thing you're not going to get bank because bank always looks for the safe ventures Right. The equity market, okay, they would be kind of uh, just too risky to be listed. So you need somebody kind of, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, helping them to grow. So similar to, I say, an intermediary, not exactly as a replica of the venture capital before, but something with this ESG objectives and finding it out. So that probably over time, it may happen, may not happen. But uh, looking at like, you know, because we're still like, you know, today's uh, whatever I've just learned, okay, a uh, little bit from today's discussion, that still all this ESG is still confined with the traditional modes of finance, right? Green bond, green bond is after all, yeah, at the end of the day is a bond, right? So whether it's called a blue bond and etc., just kind of, say kind of one particular thing on, in this context, okay? Say, for example, if a green bond pays money, then people don't ask questions, okay, whether there's been invested in the green technology or blue technology or whatever it is. The investors are kind of quite happy. So, which means that there is no rating agencies that will kind of give, that will give the ratings in both dimensions, the probability of bankruptcy and also the quality of the project. Right. Unless those sort of instruments do not, rather institutions do not appear in the market, probably I'll see that is uh, the traditional finance, as you say, bank or this will kind of uh, grow. And then if there is some need or some vacuum, then probably that will kind of uh, come up. Okay. <laughs> thank you. This is a good time to finish. So uh, let me thank all the panelists for, for their contribution and everybody for the attention. Thank you.